you do enough extractions, I guarantee you, you will break some buckle plates. Now this is nothing to lose sleep over, but it's something that we want to try to minimize if at all possible. So this video is going to show you some ways that we can prevent this, some of the causes of it, and the way that we want to manage it should it occur to you. So the first thing would be the causes. So what causes this to happen? Well, you could have uh, the improper direction of your forces. So let's say you grab a tooth and you just pull to the buckle and you just keep going buckle, 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 and tooth comes out. And usually it's going to come out with the buckle plate because you didn't do any movements to the lingual or palatal direction. So make sure that you are applying movements slowly in either direction to allow the bone some time to expand. So that's the next point. If you make a sudden jerky movement or just push really hard one way in, in a quick movement, you're going to end up sometimes breaking the buckle bone because you're not giving it time to get out of the way. Now the other thing would be if you have a divergent root structure, so sometimes an upper molar, let's say an upper first molar, the roots are facing way away from one another, there is no path of withdrawal there that is common amongst all those roots. There is one and it's through the buccal plate and you'll experience that if you try to force that tooth out of the socket. The other thing might be ankylosis. So now a lot of dentists seem to think if they have a tough extraction it was ankylosed and that's probably not the case but ankylosis does exist. There will be times where you take a tooth out and it is very firmly fused onto the bone and it's difficult to separate those two pieces. So there is true ankylosis where it may make it difficult to get that tooth out without taking some bone with it. Third thing might be, and especially say down in these lower incisors down here, sometimes you just have really, really thin bone. So there's just not much bone there. And despite your best efforts, you're going to end up breaking some of the cortical bone there because there's just not enough there to hold up to the pressures of the extraction. So we've worked at a tooth, we're delivering it, and snap, we hear that crunch. That's the buccal plate breaking. Now what do we do? Well, we have to have an assessment here now. So our assessment is, is the bone still attached to the tooth or is it still attached to the gingiva or both? Now, if it's still attached to the gingiva or the periosteum, then we can usually leave that there assuming that we can separate it from the tooth fragment. Now, if the bone is loose from the gingiva, then we're not in a good situation. So we basically have to take that bone out because the odds of it healing in there are slim to none. So the blood supply for that cortical bone is so poor without that periosteum that it's going to just die and be rejected by the body. So that's our first thing that we need to look at. If that bone is connected to the tooth and it is still connected to the periosteum, then what we can try to do is we can sometimes use a periosteal. So let's say that it was our upper canine tooth, which is a very common one to break that buccal plate on. So we've applied lots of forces here. The tooth it basically came out. It's now mobile, but the bone is moving with it. If you can get your periosteal in down along the buccal surface of this tooth and slowly kind of push and pry, you might be able to separate those two pieces, keeping the bone attached to the periosteum and allowing you to deliver the canine tooth. If the bone is thick enough up there, sometimes what you can do, or maybe on a different area of the mouth where you have thicker bone on that buccal surface, is you could use a really thin burr like the 700 burr or a 699 burr, surgical length, go in there with your surgical hand piece and basically remove a little sliver of tooth. So you're doing like a crown prep at the expense of the tooth, trying to salvage the bone and cutting down beyond where the bone is connected to that tooth to allow it to get freed up a little bit. Let's say that you managed to get that bone off of the tooth. Well, the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to be placing a suture in there not because we definitely need a suture to close up the extraction site because you didn't have a flap or anything, but we want to try to stabilize the bone. So we're going to use a figure of eight suture or a horizontal mattress suture, something that's very, very firm, very rigid to try to hold that plate in place so it's not mobile as it's trying to heal. That'll give you the best chance of the bone again integrating with the rest of the bone and not being rejected by the body. You should be informing your patient of this situation to tell them that if that bone does not heal properly, it may come through the gingiva or they may feel something poking out that looks a little bit white and sharp and they might have to come back to you for a second procedure to remove it. 
Now let's say that we can't separate these things. So let's say that we broke that buckle plate. We've tried to get things off of there and we just can't. So now we're gonna to have to basically reside to the fact that the bone is coming out with the tooth. Sometimes you may have to lift the flap a little bit because it could be a decent section of bone. And if you try to just pull it out, you're gonna tear your flap. So you're gonna to have to go in there with your periosteal, let's say again, we're working on this upper canine, and we'll try to release the papilla and kind of undermine a little bit of a flap here without doing any incisions or anything. It's not usually that severe, but you want to try to undermine enough of the flap that you can bring that bone through without applying tension or tearing the flap. Once it's out of there, you need to palpate. So let's say we've now we've got the tooth out, the bone here is mobile, and we can feel some edges here. So again, that's a reason for undermining this flap so that we can now get to those regions with our bone file, which would be here. We put it in there and with some pull strokes, we're basically trying to smooth down some of the bony edges from that plate that was removed, right? And now again, we're gonna feel once we're done to make sure that feels smooth on our finger. If it doesn't, we can reach for our rangeur and we could use that again to get in there and clip little bit of bone and again go over it with our bone file and then we want to irrigate that really really well with a monoject syringe and sterile saline have a white suction tip or a blue suction tip something very very narrow to get in under the flap to the base of the flap to get all those little bony spicules out of there and once that happens again we're going to go ahead and place our suture now this is in an aesthetic zone and if the patient was planning an implant here, you may have some knowledge of grafting and that's a great thing. So if you do, it's been an indication to place a membrane and a graft to try to build that area up while it's healing. For those of you who don't have that experience or don't have any bone grafting experience, you'll want to do it how I just described it. Final thing to say is as you get taking out more and more teeth, you're going to get comfortable with the type of patients that you're dealing with and the type of teeth that you're dealing with. Sometimes you're going to be able to predict or have a pretty good idea when you're going to be facing a situation where there will be a buccal plate fracture. So let's say we've got an older patient, maybe in their 60s, big bone. So you look down on the tooth and they've got fairly wide bone here. It looks like things are pretty stiff and the roots are very divergent on the radiograph. You may choose to section that tooth versus trying to deliver it with the forceps, which will allow you to have different paths of withdrawal for the roots to place less stress on the buccal plate. That's one option. The other thing may be, let's say we're taking out, say this upper second molar here, we've got nothing in behind it. We can go in there, if we think this is gonna be a difficult extraction, we're risking breaking the buccal plate or even tuberosity in this case, we can take this again, 700 burr or 699 burr, and basically drop kind of a trough all the way around the mid buckle, right around the distal of that tooth, just to cut a bunch of that bone away. You're going to go down maybe five, six millimeters in there along the root surface of that tooth to free up some of that buccal bone and distal bone before you even start elevating. So that's a good way to kind of get things separated prior to applying any forces. We'll also discuss this later, but if you're taking out an upper posterior tooth again, say like uh, it's the last one in the arch, upper second molar here, you may wish to use a periosteal or some type of elevator that allows you to get in on the distal buckle and bu buckle aspect of that tooth. And you're going to push hard at the very beginning, trying to separate the bone from the tooth and get a little bit of space between those again before you even start elevating. So you could do that instead of using your handpiece, just use an instrument and really work it in. Try to kind of push it down along there. You could use a luxator as well. It can be difficult to get into that area of the mouth unless you have a special angle to them. So uh, do whatever you can to separate the buccal bone from the tooth prior to elevating, which is gonna make things a heck of a lot easier if that bone does break, because at least then the bone is likely not adhered to the tooth. Finally, every time that you're taking out a tooth, you need to have some form of digital sensation of what's going on. So you need to be feeling, have a tactile sense of what you're doing. So have a feel up by the tooth. Make sure that as you're applying pressures to it, you're not pushing too much pressure on the buccal bone. You'll feel it moving and bending there. And you're also putting some pressure here too to give a little bit more support. So if that is thin bone up there and your finger is also there acting to brace it a little bit, you may have less fractures there if you are uh, adding a little bit more support.